Power to the people. Power to the people. Brothers and sisters, I'm so glad that you have taken time out to join us today for our commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the 1967 Newark Rebellion. We do not say riot. We say rebellion. Say it, rebellion. Newark. 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 We say rebellion because it was a collective response to collective oppression was not a disturbance that occurred after a football game or a basketball game or a result of some personal fight dispute between individuals. It was a collective response to the years of oppression that people experienced here in this city and across the country. We say it was a rebellion because there were many of them between 19... 60 in 1971 there were more than 1,000 urban civil disturbances in the United States many people don't know that in the years 1967 and 1968 there were 384 urban uprisings in 298 cities many people don't know that in fact the popular narrative of the 60s especially when talking about black people in this country, talks mostly about the civil rights movement. But the locus, the major activities of the civil rights movement took place in the South. And if you only focus on the activities of the South, you only focus on the resistance in the South, then you are not telling the whole story of the 1960s. The resistance, black people's resistance was all over the United States. And in different regions of the country, people resisted in different ways. Most of the time, people were engaged in protests. But there were times when people just couldn't take it anymore. And while none of us would support certain kinds of activities, to say that there shouldn't have been rebellions, Pam, would be like saying there shouldn't be a hurricane, or there shouldn't be a tornado, or there shouldn't be a storm. We, we, we don't like hurricanes and tornadoes and storms, but they're part of nature. And the uprisings of the 1960s were a natural response to what people were experiencing in this country. In fact, you can't talk about the uprising of 1967 in Newark, New Jersey without putting it in the context of black people's struggle for freedom in this country from the time they brought us here in change. You can't do it. You have to put it in that context. Why we were brought here, how we were brought here, and what happened to us after we were brought here has everything to do with how we lived in these cities. The forces of racism and of class exploitation and of urbanization on black people are a direct result of our of the enslavement of our ancestors in this country. And you can't talk about the history of this country, you can't talk about the history of cities without talking about black people. This country was founded on the theft of Native American land and it was developed on the theft of African labor and that has everything to do with how we live today in the United States of America this is very important to understand this state New Jersey was a Dutch colony at first two years after the founding of this colony African slaves were brought here we've been here from the beginning who cleared the land? Who cleared the roads? Who drained the swamps? Who laid the foundations? Who built the edifices? We did. We did. Our labor, our stolen labor produced those things, and that was in New Jersey. 
And slavery was not just a southern phenomenon, it was a national phenomenon. There was slavery right here in New Jersey. There were 10,000 slaves here at the time of the American Revolution. There were, hundreds, there were thousands of slaves here at the time of the Civil War. You can't understand the process of urbanization and how we got in these cities and how we lived after we got here without understanding the process of enslavement and the exploitation of black people in this country. We built this state, we built this nation. America is a rich and powerful, in fact, it's the most rich and powerful nation in the world today, primarily because of the theft of the labor of our ancestors. They stole us, they sold us, and they owe us for 400 years of stolen labor. It's so important to understand, to put everything in context, brothers and sisters. Because if you look at history as a photograph, if you just take a snapshot of an event, you can walk away with a totally wrong understanding of what you actually see in that picture. You have to go to the roots and understand how this whole process developed. So we were in cities from the beginning. People talk about slavery down south. At one point, New York City had more slaves than South Carolina. Did you know that? Had more slaves than South Carolina. You want to talk about slavery? The most active slave port on the East Coast was New York City. Where Wall Street is today was where the slave market was historically. And guess what the most active slave port was after that? Perth Amboy, New Jersey. Perth Amboy, New Jersey. And what was the most active one after that? Camden, New Jersey. And although this state was in the North, its sympathies were with the South. Lincoln didn't win New Jersey in 1860, didn't win it in 1864. When Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation to abolish slavery, the state legislature of New Jersey nullifies Lincoln's power to emancipate slaves in this state. After the Civil War, it took, a three four, it took three fourths of the states to amend the Constitution, to pass the 13th Amendment. It took 27 of the 36 states. New Jersey wasn't in that 36, uh, 27 state supermajority needed to ratify the 13th Amendment. This state's sympathies were very much with the South. At one time, the national headquarters of the Ku Klux Klan was right there in Kenilworth, New Jersey, less than 15 minutes away. See, you got to understand history, brothers and sisters. If you don't understand history, you're going to miss the whole mission. You're going to miss the whole thing. 67 wasn't the first rebellion. It wasn't even the first rebellion in that period. Every major city in this state had an uprising. All you got to do is go back and get Governor Hughes' Blue Ribbon Commission report on civil unrest in this state. And you'll see that every major urban area in New Jersey had an uprising. Jersey City was before North, 1966. And the 60s weren't the first ones. We've been rebel. Look, the uprising of 67 was just as much a slave rebellion as our uprising was in 1865. It was a rebellion against oppression, racial oppression, and class oppression. Because we were oppressed not just because of the color of our skin, but we were oppressed as working people. And we were super exploited. We weren't just exploited as workers, we were super exploited. Because we were paid a fraction of what other workers were paid. And that's after emancipation. There were urban uprisings in the beginning. And at first, whites and blacks found common cause as indentured servants. Many people don't know that there were uprisings of the black and white indentured servants together. But they came up with an evil tool, and that evil tool was white supremacy. They were able to convince some that because of the color of their skin, they were better than others. It was a classic example of divide and conquer, and soon slavery, enslavement became coterminous with being black in America. It took about 60 years for all the colonies to pass laws that said if you were born of an African mother, you were enslaved, and these are their words, 
in perpetuity. So we were enslaved in these cities from the beginning, but we rebelled. Major uprising in New York City was a major slave rebellion. In New Orleans was a major slave rebellion. In the 19th century, there were uprisings of free blacks in the cities. After World War II, there were uprisings. This wasn't the first uprising. We've been rising up ever since they brought us here against our will. We've been fighting back, fighting for freedom, and fighting for liberation. And you have to understand what happened in 67 in that context. Because if you don't understand that history, you'll misread the whole situation. And before you know it, you'll find yourself supporting the very people that we were fighting against. You have to have an understanding of our history, brothers and sisters. So this city was an apartheid city. It was as much apartheid as Johannesburg was apartheid. In fact, you talk about apartheid, you talk about South Africa. The South Africans learned the apartheid from white Americans. There was no system of apartheid in South Africa prior to the 20th century. That's, that came into being when the Africana Party came into power. They literally lifted the segregationist laws from the books of this country and put it in their country. And then the system of Bantu stands that they developed in South Africa was based on the system of Native American reservations here in the United States. You've got to understand, brothers and sisters, the, the, the roots of our oppression. We were oppressed in this country, and from the beginning, we fought on the shores of Africa, we fought on the slave ships, we fought on the plantations, and we fought in the cities, we fought against slavery, we got that abolished, we fought against Jim Crow, we overturned that, and we're going to keep fighting until we get freedom, justice, and equality for everybody in this country. We're going to keep fighting. We're not going to stop fighting. My last dying breath, we will fight. And this was an apartheid city. This was a majority black city as early as 1960. But it was under the control of a white power structure. And don't tell me about Jim Crow in Atlanta. And don't tell me about Jim Crow in Charleston. We had Jim Crow right here in Newark, New Jersey. I'm old enough to remember. In my lifetime, we had segregated movie theaters. Did you know that? We had segregated movie theaters right here in Newark, New Jersey. Black people couldn't sit in the mezzanine. They had to sit in the balcony. We, I remember when they used to, Boylan Avenue pool was a public pool. And they used to chase us down South Orange Avenue, all the way down to the parkway, because they didn't want no black kids in Boylan Pool. I can remember that. Can't you remember that? In our lifetime. I can remember when on Olympic Park, black people could go only go to Olympic Park on certain nights. They had colored nights. But this was a situation throughout the country. This wasn't just Olympic Park here. See, we, we, we cannot just accept on face value the popular narrative of these conditions in history. We got to dig deep and get the history. But people were living in terrible conditions in Newark. Most kids today can't even understand what a cold water flat is. Can't even understand that you could live in an apartment and not have no running water. I know about, I lived in a cold water flat on Ridgewood and Avon. Only way we had hot water, we had to have a tub, put the tub on the stove. That's how we got hot water. It's a cold water flat. In 1967, more than 60% of Newark's housing was substandard. And not only cold water flat, most kids, if you less than 40 years old, you wouldn't even understand what coal heat is. Cold water flats heated with dirty coal furnaces and black children having the highest rates of asthma because of that. Because those old coal furnaces gave off those fumes and gave off that dirt. I know about it because I was one of those asthma. So I'm talking about what I know. I ain't talking about what I read or what somebody told me. I'm talking about what I know. And the police were terrible. They had a terrible reputation. They stopped people and beat people and they got away with it. There, was, there wasn't a, a, a challenge to police authority like there is today. That, that precinct right over there, the 17th 
Avenue precinct, it had a terrible reputation. You go look on that building, that building was there in 1903. That's when the 17th Avenue precinct was built. And they used to beat and, and, and brutalize and abuse black people like there was nothing to it, brothers and sisters. Like there was nothing to it. And that's what happened that night. These conditions, the high rates of poverty and the high rates of unemployment. And not just that, the fact, you know, people talk about, you know, the glory days when Springfield Avenue had all these shops and stores. Them people used to charge us four and five times what it was worth, what they sold us. Why do you think they would burn down and burn out? Because they have been cheating and exploiting our communities for so long. People responded and finally when they got John Smith and they beat him and they took him over there to the 17th Avenue precinct. They took him over there, people thought he was dead. Right over there, 17th Avenue precinct was in the heart of what was called Hayes Homes. How many people here remember Hayes Homes? You could look out the window and look down on the precinct. And so groups were protesting out there the end cup and the united brothers and core and the naacp and there was a confrontation between the police and the protesters and that's what started the uprising of 1967. And we say uprising we don't say riot if it was a riot the police could have handled it they couldn't handle it they couldn't handle it they had to call in the state troop with 700 and then they they started people talk about destruction most of the store windows that were broke were broken by the state troopers shooting into the window. They were shooting into the window. These people here, these 27, were none of them shot by snipers. That's what they want to tell you. They were killed by us. Read Ron Parambo's book, No Cause for Indictment. None of these people were killed by civilians. The medical examiner at that time looked at the bullets and said they all came from weapons held by the guard and held by the state troopers. But our people resisted. They continued, finally they had to call in the National Guard. Don't tell me about Iraq. James Harris, I know, Sister Roundtree knows, we know about military occupation. Black people were under military occupation. The governor declared a state of emergency and declared martial law. And we couldn't leave our houses. We, they, Right where I lived on 12th Street and 16th Avenue, they set up a checkpoint right in the middle of the intersection. For three days, we couldn't even leave our house. And then when they let us come out the house to go get food, they would check our cars going in and check our cars going out. The guard would go door to door looking for contraband. Go come in our houses. We know about military occupation. Don't talk about terrorism in Iraq. Talk about the racial terrorism that black people experienced in this country for 250 years and for 400 years that we've been here. We know about it, brothers and sisters. It's so important that we understand. But people rose up and they brought in the guard and they brought in the state troopers. And you would have think that that would have been the end of it. But I'm here to tell you that two weeks after the rebellion, we had a black power conference right here in Newark, New Jersey. Two weeks after the rebellion, right downtown Newark, was the Black Power Conference of 1967. And from where I'm standing right now, I can see West Kenny Junior High School, right there. West Kenny High School was where the Black Power Convention was held in 1968. And where they call it University High School now, it was called Clinton Place Junior High School then, over on the other side, Clinton Avenue, near Lyons Avenue, Clinton Place was where the Black and Puerto Rican Convention was held. And I'm telling you, there, there was a lot of physical destruction in 1967. There was a lot, but you know what else there was? There was the liberation of our minds. Most black people wouldn't even, if you called them black before 1967, they'd be ready to fight. But after 1967, and after James Brown said, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, we all was talking about we was black. Ken Gibson ran for election in 1966. He lost the first time. And in 1970, the corrupt mayor, Adonisio, was under indictment, still took Gibson to the runoff. If we had not had that uprising 
in 1967, people might not have been in a frame of mind to achieve victory in 1970. And, my, and remember, we didn't achieve complete victory in 1970. We elected the mayor, but we still had a white city council, predominantly white city council, until 1974. That's the origins of black power. And people say, well, what lessons, what do you learn from all of this? The fundamental lesson that we should learn from this is what Frederick Douglass told us 150 years ago. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Power can see nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. And this is the, this is the great lesson. If you teach black history and you only teach it about famous people and inventions and names and dates, you missing the whole point of black history. Because the whole point of our history is to transmit to our people and to our youth in particular that our mission here is to struggle for the liberation of our people. That each generation must struggle and accomplish as much as it can and then pass the baton on to the next generation. One might say that we're in a great intergenerational relay race, passing the baton from generation to generation. And our struggle is not over. Our people are still oppressed. We see 50 years later, there are twice as many poor people in America as there were in 1967. The unemployment rate for black people is three times what it was in 1968. More people living in poverty, more people unemployed. We still have to continue to fight. And police brutality is as much a problem today as it was when they beat John Smith in 1967. If there hadn't been an organization protesting and fighting police brutality in this city, this, the North Police Department would have never been put under a consent decree. They would have never been put under a federal monitor. That happened because we struggle. We have to fight and continue to fight, brothers and sisters, and fight on all levels, and use every means available to us. Use the vote, yes, sir. use our dollars, and use our marching feet. We got to use everything that is available to us. Everything, everything. Things I mentioned and things that I won't mention. <laughs> everything, everything. What did Malcolm say? By any means necessary. Brothers and sisters, I'm so glad to see so many of you have come out today. We've had this observance every year since the People's Organization was founded. Our organization was founded in August of 1983, August 28th, when we ratified our Constitution. And for 33 years since then, we've had this observance. We come here today to honor the people that were killed during the rebellion. And you see here the names of all the people that were killed. And what we're going to do at this point, we have some flowers. Are there any young people here? Somebody push, push your son or daughters out here. Where the, where the flowers? All right. We're going to have a moment of silence. What's your name, young man? Idris. 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 Say it loud. Say it in here. Idris. Idris. Right, I want you to go and put these flowers right in front of that stone right here. All right. Thank you, Idris. We're going to read through the list. Then we'll have a moment of silence. Then we're going to hear... I see my friend Dave is here. I was hoping Dave would show up. We're going to hear from family members of the people whose names are on this monument. This monument was erected in 1997 after request from citizens here and organizations here in this city. Councilman George Branch was the councilman of the Central Ward at that time. 
and he took the lead, and the City Council of Newark made this happen in 1997. Uh, we were having the observance even before this was here. Our first observance was in 1984. We used to have what we call the Black Liberation March on the day of the rebellion. But after they put this here, we started having these more formal uh, observances. So I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to ask, uh, and that, where's, where's Vice Chairwoman Ingrid Hill? Where's I'm going to ask Vice Chairwoman, you, you want, you, you're too comfortable or you want to come up? I'm going to let you read the names. Read, read the names. After I read the names, they presented. Rose Abraham. Elizabeth Abdis. T. Doc Bell. Leroy Ford. Rebecca Brown. Mary Helen Campbell. Rufus Council. William Furr. Hattie Gaynor. Raymond Gilmer. Isaac Harrison, Rufus Hawk, Oscar Hill, Jesse Mae Jones, Robert Martin, Albert Miser, Captain Michael Moran, Eddie Moss, Cornelius Murray, Michael Pugh, James Rutledge, Victor Lewis Smith, James Sanders, Eloise Spellman, Richard Tanya Farrell, and Detective Fred Toto. Thank you. Now, if we could just have a moment of silence for those who were killed during the rebellion. A moment of silence. If you're so inclined, raise your fist power to the people. Thank you. We're going to hear from the family members of folks who are on this monument. Then we're going to march over to the police station and march back, and then we're going to hear the rest of the speakers. Um, if there are family members of any of the people who are on the monument, if y'all would come close. And the first person I'm going to call is the first person I saw the first family member I saw here today is Kimberly Spellman. She's here, I believe, with other family members and grandchildren. They're the children and grandchildren of Eloise Spellman. This Eloise Spellman name right here. Where's, where's Kim and Pam? Oh, you hiding? Give them a hand. They're going to tell you what happened to their mother in 1967. Yes. Could all my sisters and brothers, my nieces, my nephews, my great nieces, my great nephews, all of Eloise Spellman's children and grandchildren, please come up here with Aunt Kim. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We so appreciate you. If you could just be patient with me. I need one of my nieces. I gotta help on Kim. Where's my young one? No, they both have to be together, Mr. Hampstead. So, go ahead, Kim. I'm going to take you back a little bit, if y'all don't mind. I remember this day. This is the 30th commemorative anniversary, July the 9th, 1997. It was the first year that we came here.
I want to thank Honorable George Branch, like I thanked him before. I want to thank the Reverend Church, James Churchwell from the Emmanuel Church of Christ, the Souls of Integrity, the Voices of Hope, Evangelist Patty Roscoe, Miss Eddie Mae Livingston, and also Miss Jackie Slap, and Kenneth Gibson, and Mr. James Sharp. Those are the people that were there for me when I was growing up. Mr. Ham and the People's Organization for Progress, they were there for us, the Spelman family. Way before we were here, we were going to the church, I think it's West McKinney, the church, the Baptist church, I was a little younger, but um, I remember coming. I remember all the young people marching. I remember the signs. I remember the names. I remember the old way we used to do it. I like it when we march. I like it when we interact with the people in the community. I live in New York City. This is my home. I was born here. My mom had me here. I was born at Martin Hospital. Martin Martin. Am I pronouncing it right? Y'all help me out. Come on, help me, y'all. Y'all my family. That's what it say on my birth certificate. Okay. And I was raised in foster care. It separated me from my brothers and sisters. Here in Jersey, they sent the four youngest, the four babies, to New York. And we were raised in foster homes. And then we were taken out of foster homes and separated again. So I was separated from my brothers, my oldest brother at the time, and my sisters, and my baby brothers. My brother Richard Spellman, my sister Sharon, my sister Dee Dee, my brother Michael, and my brother Carl are no longer here with us. I have my sister Pam, I have my brother Frank, we call him Chubby, I have my brother Bruce, I have a sister Crystal, and I have an elder sister, Brenda Spellman, she's my sister, she's my mom's oldest child. But I had another sibling too. My mom was pregnant, she was two months pregnant, when those bullets hit her through that window. They don't talk about it, and they say 26 victims, but I don't care. I always say 27, because that would have been my little baby brother or sister. So it is what it is. They call me the rebel in the family, but I just, I'm very emotional. I can't help it. I'm just an emotional person. I love hard, and I love Newark. I love Newark. I love you so much. I love the people. I love the streets. I love that smell when I know I'm coming into New York. Uh, it, that's home to me. When I used to come to visit, I knew I was home. There's nothing like it. I would like, I'm not gonna hold y'all too long because there's so much I have to say, so much I need to say to my people. First of all, to the people here in the community, right here in this community, right here at Urban Turner, I'd like to say thank you. I don't know if y'all listening, the ones that have been here for me, the days when I have come here, when there was no memorial, when the bench wasn't here, it was over there. And I used to just sit in the bench and talk with the people. My brothers and sisters didn't even know I was here. Oh, I snuck over from New York and came here just on a regular day. And the people were always good to me, always nice to me. I never felt afraid. I never felt afraid. Only thing that used to scare me were the police. It used to bother me, and not even bother me, but um, it made me question why would they send out 3,000 National Guards, 300 state troopers, because they said the regular police could not handle the crowd. 
They constantly say rebellion is not it. It was a rebellion. It was never a riot. It was a rebellion. The people rebelled against what was going on. I was a little young. I was, what, three, four? How old was my sister? So they remember more than I do. But the things that I do remember from that day, when they took us out the apartment, it's embedded in my head, y'all. It hurts every day. Every day. They took all of us out the apartment. They treated us like nothing. They forgot about the children. My mom was bleeding. My mom was shot from the waist up. Let me break it down, because they ain't going to break it down to you in this autopsy reports, in the ballistic reports, in the homicide reports. She was shot 12 times from the waist up. The bullet that perforated her neck, she bled out. Ambulance? You can forget about that. There was no ambulances able to get past the tanks and past the police. It was martial law. The ambulances didn't get to our building for a good hour, right? People were dying. I want to say two more things, and I'm not going to hold y'all. I'm sorry. The children and the elders, I want y'all to listen to me, and all y'all in the middle. There was never a sniper. The snipers were the National Guard shooting at the state troopers, the state troopers shooting at the National Guard, the National Guard shooting at the police, the police shooting at the, the, the state troopers. There was no sniper. Go on YouTube. Some of you young adults, young people, y'all go on YouTube. There's a audio, a radio audio, no visual. Y'all gonna have to listen. Listen. It relates all the police calls throughout the riots and the one thing I remember hearing them say over and over and over because I listened to it periodically throughout the years there is no sniper the police kept telling the police there's no sniper what are y'all doing hold your fire hold your fire there's no snipers there's no snipers the National Guards are on top of the roof so if the National Guards is on top of the roof and they shooting down and in, in the state troopers and the National Guards are here on our grounds. Where's the sniper at? I got one more thing I want to speak on. And then I'm going to let Mr. Ham, I'm going to give you back the mic. I know you know. Just one more thing, Mr. Ham, please. Because these are things that they won't show my people. And these are things that I went through years. My baby brother Mike and I, we got put out of City Hall. I got put out of City Hall when I was in college. I went to City Hall. I wanted this autopsy report. I wanted this ballistics report. I wanted this homicide report. I went to the Bureau of Vital Statistics. I told him my name. I asked for it. My baby brother was waiting for me outside. He came with me. He said, Sister, go. They wouldn't give it to me. I said, okay. They go, the rebel came in me. I went. I ain't gonna tell no story. I'm gonna be honest, cause that's just me. I went and got a fake ID. I said Tracy Anderson. I went back. I didn't change up too much, cause it wasn't. I was, I was in my twenties. I just did something. All I know is that the lady didn't know it was me, and she gave me this. She gave me this, and after she gave it to me, I went outside and I snuck in the lawyer's entrance. They could have rebel in me. I was snuck in the lawyer's entrance. Somewhere or the other, security guard, well, I'm sorry, I'm going a little bit ahead of me. When I was leaving out, the security guard escorted me out because he recognized me. He said, you the lady was here yesterday. He escorted me out. So I felt violent. I felt like I was stealing. I felt like I was stealing. Like I had to lie to get what I needed. Information that I wanted to know about. So, I went through the lawyer's entrance. I went upstairs. I went to James Sharp's office. The secretary, very nice to me. Mr. James Sharp, so good to me. He sat me down. I must have been, I'm 54 now. I'm 54 years old. I was four years old then when the riots happened. I'm 54 now. I was in my 20s when this happened. 
Mr. James Sharp sat me down in his office and he said, Ms. Spellman, anytime you need anything, you need any documentation, you need any videos, you need anything, you come directly to the office and you ask. I never had no problems like that again. I was always welcome and anything else that I needed, I would talk to Mr. Ham about or one of the, um, the councilmen that would help me, different people help me. And I want to say thank you to all of those that helped me to get so much that I had that I couldn't have got just from the city. I don't know why they didn't want us to have it. I don't. But I'm, my last thing is I want to read the people. I know you already read the names, but I want to go a little bit further. I might not say the names correctly, the spelling of the, of the name, but just bear with me. I need somebody to hold the mics. Somebody take that picture from Pam so that she can hold the mics. Mr. Neal, can you help me? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to start from number one. First of all, this is the homicide reports and autopsy reports and ballistic reports. May I have that envelope? Let me give them where I got this from because you can go get it nowadays. You don't have to do like I did. Where's that top cover? You got it? Oh, I'm sorry, sister. Thank you. Let me let them know, because I need them to be able to young people. It's a report for action. The Governor's Select Commission on Civil Disorder in the State of New Jersey, February 1968. Number one, the race. Thank you, Mr. Carter, for differentiating to me, it does not necessarily mean nigger, it means negroid. We were listed as negroids in those days. You either were listed under an N or W. There was no African American, others, and none of that. Go in the library, you can read exactly what I'm looking at. Okay, number one, I'm gonna go straight across. Rose Abraham, Bloom Street, Newark, 45 years of age, negroid. Brought to hospital by husband. Homicide. Shooting. Y'all listen carefully to me. Because I can't I only got so much time and I'm gonna go through all 26. Insufficient evidence. Number two, Elizabeth Artis, 38 Prince Street, Newark, 68 years old, Negroid, at home. Homicide by shooting. Insufficient evidence passed through. Number three. Tedrick Bell, 411 Bergen Street, Newark, 28 years old, brought to hospital by friends, homicide by shooting, irregular lead fragments, insufficient evidence. Number four, Leroy Boyd, 322 Belmont Avenue, Newark, 37 years old, found on the sidewalk of Belmont and Avon Avenue, auto accident, fractured pelvis. No, ev no evidence, just says N-O-N-E, none. Number five, Rebecca Brown, 293 Bergen Street, Newark, 29 years old, 29 years old, at home in an apartment through the window, homicide by shooting, insufficient evidence. Number six, Mary Helen Campbell, 380 Hawthorne Avenue, Newark, 40 years old, in a car at High and Spruce Street. Homicide by shooting. None, just N-O-N-E. Mary Helen Campbell, 40 years old. I just read her, I'm sorry. Number seven, Rufus Council, 1 Prince Street, Newark, 32 years old, found on a sidewalk. Homicide by shooting. Insufficient evidence, 22 caliber bullet, Left twist none. Pass through. No evidence. Number eight, Isaac Harrison, 73 years old. In the streets at Springfield and Broom. Homicide by shooting. Pass through. Number nine, Jesse May Jones, 255 Fairmont Avenue, Newark, 31 years old. On her stoop. Homicide by shooting, insufficient, insufficient evidence. Okay, Lord. Number 10, Willie Burr, 2 Hollywood Avenue, 21 years old. 
homicide by shooting, pass through. One leg fragment, no value for ID, insufficient evidence. Number 11, I'm almost there y'all, I'm so sorry. Hattie Gaynor, 302 Hunterton Street, Newark, in her apartment, homicide, insufficient evidence. Number 12, Raymond Gilmore, 355 Ferry Street, North, 20 years old. Insufficient evidence. Number 12, Raymond Gilmore, 355 Ferry Street, North. Homicide in the streets. Insufficient evidence. I don't have to go to the other paper. 13, Rufus Hawk, 103 Bruce Street, North, 24 years old. Death by homicide. Insufficient evidence. Number 14, Oscar Hill. 497 Belmont Street, Newark, 50 years old. Homicide by shooting. Bullet passed through. Insufficient evidence. Insufficient evidence. I'm sorry. What number was I up to? Y'all come on, help me. Number 15. Okay. Robert Martin, 24 West Market Street, 22 years old. On the street, on the street at Broome and Merce, Mercer. Mercer. Pass through. Number 16, Albert Mer Mercier. I've heard their name and their family. I've met some of their family. 240 Livingston Street, Newark. Passenger and car at Hawthorne near Belmont. Insufficient evidence. Pass through. Eddie Moss, 240 Livingston Street, Newark. 10 years old, the youngest of the victims. Negroid passenger and car at Hawthorne near Belmont. Pass through insufficient characteristics for ID. Number 18, Cornelius Murray, 16 Wayne One Wright Street, Wayne Wright Street in North on the sidewalk of Junes near Springfield. Homicide by shooting. Insufficient evidence. Number 19. Victor Lewis Smith, 32 Barclay Street, Newark, 22 years old, in a hallway at 26 Edmond Place. They say he died from an overdose. And it still says insufficient evidence. Okay, number, what number am I on? Y'all help me. Number 20, Michael Pugh, 340 15th Avenue, Newark, 12 years old on the sidewalk in front of his home. Insufficient evidence, homicide by shooting, shotgun, shotguns. These are all shotguns. Number 21, James Rutledge, 171 Lehigh Avenue, Newark, 19 years old, inside of Joe Ray Tavern, Bergen and Custer's in Bergen and Custer, Bergen and Custer. It says 38 caliber bullets, two of the five bullets, insufficient characteristics for ID, three bullets with the rifling of five lands, five rows, right twist, pass through insufficient evidence. Number 22, my mom, Eloise Spellman. 322 Huntington Street, Newark, 41 years old, inside her apartment, minding her business with her children, taking care of babies. Homicide by shooting. Superficial wound. Insufficient evidence. Number 23, James Sander, 52 Beacon Street, Newark, 16 years old at or near Sampson's liquor store on Springfield and Jones. Insufficient evidence, death by homicide, shotgun. Number 24, Richard Talif Talia Farrell, 124 North 7th Street, 100-11th Avenue, 25 years old, leaving the store at South 8th Street and 11th Street. Homicide by shotgun, insufficient evidence. Number 25, Detective Fred.
Fred, Tutu, 58 Smith Street, Newark, 33 years old, white male, Broom and Mercer Street. Evidence. 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 22 caliber lead, nose portion, bullet recovered. Bullet recovered. The only bullet was recovered. Bullet recovered. Bullet recovered. Bullet recovered. Number 26. Fireman Captain Michael Moran, 66 Eastern Parkway, Newark. 41 years old, white male, at scene of a fire, Central and South 7th Street. Homicide by shooting, bullet wound, left flask, metallic bullet, evidence recovered. 30 slash 06 rifle bullet recovered. Not valid casting. Casting was not recovered. Thank you. I'm not going to be long at all because my sister said it all. But I want everybody to know that time don't heal all folks. Time didn't heal this wound because every day of my life, my mother, Eloise Bellamy, comes to mind. And every day, I miss my mother. Give the Spellman family a big hand. Give them a hand. We're going to hear from one more person. We're going to have speakers all along the way. I'm proud to say that the former councilman, y'all not going to believe this, the former councilman of the Central Ward is here, Dennis Westbrooks. Give him a big hand. Give him a big hand. He's going to speak to us a little later. Dr. E. Wyman Garrett is here. He was on the board when I got there in 71. Give him a big hand. Junius Williams is here. Put this whole five days together. Give him a big hand. Put the whole five days together. We're going to hear from Junius. We're going to hear from the nephew of Albert Messier, who's on the monument. Then we're going to march over to the police station, march back, and we're going to hear the rest of the speakers. So this is my friend, my colleague, my close companion, Dave Armstrong. Give him a big hand. The nephew of Albert Messier. Thank you, thank you. Uh, let me keep this brief. I'm here with my grandson, called Pop Pop. Um, again, as Mr. Han said, um, he's truly a soldier in the army. He's truly a soldier in the war. Power to the people. Power to the people. I was 10 years old when my uncle got killed in the rebellion. He was 18 years old. You know, I had a brief time with him when he taught me basketball. He was my role model. He was deeply missed. I mean, I have all aunts, and he was my only uncle from their parents. I'd like to thank my aunt, Roberta, his sister who's here, but she's very shy. Normally my mother come here, Anne-Marie Penn. She usually had pictures, but unfortunately she's not really feeling very well, so I'm here to represent the family. I just want to thank each and every one of you for your continued support, and we're going to keep this alive. This is the 50th anniversary. We're going to go to the 100th anniversary because the war is not over. The rebellion is not over, and I want to thank again each and every one of you guys and continue to struggle. Thank you, Dave. Give Dave a big hand. I have to defer to the senior citizen. He said he can't take much more. <laughs> Let's give a big hand to Julius Williams. We're going to hear from Julius right here. <laughs> they say that uh, freedom is something really very hard to come by. Oh Lord, we struggled so long. Those of us who are gathered here today got a leg up on those of us who didn't come. Because you can get free if you free your mind. And I have a little something here that I found. Franz Fanon. Franz Fanon was a Caribbean black man who had a who was from a colony of France. 
and he was a doctor, but he became well known as a freedom fighter. And he said they didn't want to colonize just the land, but to colonize the person. Colonize the land, but colonize the person. In other words, if you don't know who you are, they'll keep on doing it to you. And that is what we have to worry about more than anything else. More than anything else. So I appreciate Larry Ham for convening us every year at this monument. I appreciate the Spellman sister for telling us and reading and calling the roll. You should know those things. I want to tell you just a little bit about what I was doing during that time. Because yes, I was on hand. I was here. I was not just an observer because at some point somebody had to take the information and the evidence about what was going on, what the police were doing to us. So I was a law student at the time and I had some other law students working with me. We were working on urban renewal at the time, trying to figure out how we were going to stop the medical school from taking all the land they wanted to take and eventually we did. But we got called off to say, well, the police are rioting. They are killing people indiscriminately and we need somebody to go out and take affidavits. So all the names that she read, most of them, most of the evidence that was collected, evidence from witnesses, people who actually saw things were collected by my law students, me and my law students. We did that. We did that. Now, I want to just tell you about one in particular that really disturbed me. And his name was James Rutledge. He was on that list that was called. He was 19 years old. And he and a friend went into Joe Gray's bar to get some liquor in a leftover liquor store. They had already been looted. They were in there looking for scraps. Two of them. So the state police rolled up on them while they were there. One of them hid. James Rutledge did not. He was willing to take whatever medicine they had in terms of the law. Okay, Your Honor, uh, okay, officer, I'm here. Arrest me, take me downtown. But instead, according to the witness, they said, well, look what we have here and proceeded to summarily execute that young man. The record says shot multiple times. He was shot 39 times, including some in the top of his head, which means he was shot while he was on the floor. The witness hid. He stayed hidden. That's why we're able to tell this story. Now, the horror of it is that we turn all of this evidence over to the authorities. Young Spellman said, the record said there was no evidence. We turned all of these affidavits over to the authorities. There was a young man who was prosecutor at that time, and his name was Brendan Byrne. Brendan Byrne later became governor of the state of New Jersey. I heard him at the 40th commemoration say that one episode really bothered him. He wished he had had some information about one particular killing and the one that he named was James Rutledge. I wanted to run up and hand him the affidavit to show what there was because they never did anything against any of the police, although it was shown that there were 250 complaints about snipers, there never was one sniper found. And no evidence of a sniper. There was no evidence. There were no spent shells. You figure if you're going to be a sniper and you up somewhere, you're not going to have time to find all the bullet cases, are you? They never found a, 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 a footprint. They never found a fingerprint. There was no evidence of a sniper because there were no snipers. And the whole criminal justice system banded together to protect the guilty. 
all those cops who shot innocent people like Mrs. Spellman who went to pull the window down because she heard all of the ruckus in front of her apartment. So colonizing the mind, colonizing the mind. If you don't understand what that said, you still colonize. If you understand that this can happen again and again and again, we have a fancy word for that nowadays throughout the world. We call the death of these people collateral damage. You see, the goal was to bring law and order back. So they were commissioned to bring law and order back. So they went out and they killed people to bring law and order back. Those people, well, that's unfortunate. They were collateral damage. If you look around the world today in your name, with your taxpayer money, that's what's happening. Whether it be in Iraq, whether it be in Syria, whether wherever it is, that's what we have to worry about because the beat goes on. I'm very glad you all are here today because you are among the educated. So you got to go out and teach people what you learned here today, what we need to be worried about, what we need to be aware of so that we don't have to con continue to worry about collateral damage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Give Julius Williams a big hand. He was a, not just an eyewitness to history. He was an agent for change in history. What do we want? Justice. What do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. What do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. What do we want it? Now. What do we want? What do we want it? What do we want? What do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. What do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. What do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. What do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. What do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. What do we want it? Now. What do we want? What do we want it? What do we want? What do we want it? What do we want? What do we want it? What do we want? What do we want it? What do we want? What do we want it? What do we want? What do we want it?
Rebellion! North! Rebellion! North! Rebellion! North! Rebellion! North! Rebellion! North! Rebellion! When I say North, you say Rebellion! North! Rebellion! North! Rebellion! What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! That's your brother right there, right? That's his brother right there on the cover. This one on the cover of Time magazine. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That's 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 John Smith right there. That's the brother whose arrest and beating by the Newark police precipitated the demonstration which sparked the rebellion of 1967. I didn't even know John Smith had passed away until a reporter called me and told me and she said, by the way, I've talked to his brother. And I said to her, please invite his brother to be with us. I didn't even know he was here, but he was here. I saw him, but I didn't know he was James. <laughs> I saw you because you talk. I saw you stand in the crowd. But I, I, he didn't really want to speak. But I ask, I beg you to say a few words to the people who are gathered here today. Give them a big hand, y'all. Give them a big hand. Thank you, everyone. Really, uh, uh, this is not uh, not my thing, uh, you know, to chat, right? But uh, I think um, I think Jay would be happy. I think he would be honored. Um, of uh, the respect shown. Um, also, I think it would be a bit sad. Uh, me, myself, now, uh, looking at the stone with the names on it. Um, once again, uh, I use the word bittersweet. It's bitter that uh, the names are there because the names that are on the stone are people that, that they're gone. They're still in the rib cage, still in the heart. But they're gone. And it's happiness because the names are there for them for recall. Um, and I appreciate it. 
I appreciate everything. Um, I'm really not a public speaker, guys. Yeah, yeah, brother. Give him a big brother, hand. Give him a big hand. Hey, you, you connecting us to history, brother. You making a solid connection to the history. No, thank you for coming today. Is 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 Dennis Westbrooks, Reverend Westbrooks, in the crowd? Come on up. Come on up. I, you know, I had to call him June Bay. Y'all right, yes, heard of Charles Barron in New York, right? Yeah. This was our Charles Barron in 1970. This brother was so militant, he had an African name. <laughs> we call him Mjumbe. Mjumbe. That's right. Swahili for voice of the people. And this brother was on the original community choice ticket. Remember I told you how we had a black power conference in North? After the Black Power Conference of 67, there was a Black Power Convention right a block away at West Kenny High School. And then there was a Black and Puerto Rican Convention at Clinton Place Junior High School, which is now called University High School. Out of that convention came the Community Choice Ticket. It was Ken Gibson for Mayor, Sharp James for South Ward, Dennis Westbrooks for Central Ward. Who else was on the ticket? Was Earl Harris on the ticket? Oh, Earl Harris at, at large. Anybody uh, else? Ramon and Yeses. Ramon and Yeses for at large or North Ward? At large. At large. But that was a community choice ticket of 19th <laughs> and Ted Pinckney was on that ticket. But I just felt, I hope the families will excuse me, but we had two powerful connections to history. James Smith, the brother of John Smith, whose beating started the rebellion, and the product of black power, of newborn black power in North. Had it not been for, and Reverend Roundtree is here too. I don't want to forget Reverend Roundtree. Had it not been for the rebellion, we might not have elected Ken Gibson in uh, 1970. But I'm going to let him Jumbe. Now, at that time, I was called a Demu Chunga. <laughs> I still call a Demu Chunga. But I was so militant, I couldn't get a job. See, see that's one of the perils of being militant. <laughs> Nobody will hire you. Especially if your name in the newspaper every day. And they, we didn't even have the internet back then. But this was the only brother that would give me a job. That's how I made a living while I was on the Board of Education, because the Board of Education wasn't a paying job. He hired me as his aide, and he used to make me leaflet all of Hayes' homes by myself. But it kept bread and food on the table. But I love you, Mjumbe. We love you. Give him a big hand. Dennis Westbrook's Mjumbe. Okay, I'm not going to be long, I promise, because I'm just happy to be here 50 years later because I could have been dead and gone. Uh, surprisingly enough, next year I will be 80. <laughs> and that's a long time, folks. Now, when I ran for councilman, my slogan was power to the people. And I see it, it is still a slogan. That's right. Thanks to you. I came, I live in Pittsburgh now. And probably one of the reasons I didn't get elected in 79 is because I was probably too militant. <laughs> and uh, I was hurt by that loss. I'm a minister by profession. So when uh, in 75 or 76 I got a call to a church, I took it. Yes. I didn't want to, but I took it. The church was in New York. But anyway, Newark has always been on my heart. I'm glad to be here. I drove from Pittsburgh to be here, and I'll come back here anytime this man asks me to come back here. It's my second home. I love Newark. If I'd got reelected, I know I'd still be here. I know I would have still been here. But anyway, I'm just glad to be here and be a part. I'm alive and well, thank God. And uh, as often as I can come back here to be with you, I will do so. Is that right, Brother Malachi? Okay. And support this brother. He's a good brother. I'm proud of what he's doing. And I hope you keep on keeping on, brother. There you go. M. Jumbe. M. Jumbe. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Power to the people. Power to the people. Power to the people. Y'all don't know how that warms my heart. City of Jumbe, after 40 years. Wow. 40 years since I, I left him 
June Bay in 74, I went back to school. My term on the board was up. Mayor Gibson said I was the worst appointment he ever made. <laughs> I could, that's what he said. It's in the newspaper. But I, I proudly, yeah, it was true. I proudly bear that title. But today I want to make a call. Is, is Mildred Crump here? Where's, where's Mildred? Where's Mildred? She's not here. Okay, she didn't walk over. Well, I want to make a public call. I'll make it again back at the monument. I call today upon the mayor of Newark. And I call upon the city of council of Newark. I call upon the mayor to make a proclamation. And I call upon the Newark City Council to pass a resolution to now and henceforth forevermore not to refer to the uprising of 1967 as a riot, but to officially refer to it as a rebellion from this point forevermore. That is an official request on my part to the mayor and the city council of Newark. I heard the mayor last night at the very great rally at uh, West Kenny Junior High School, and he himself uh, made the clarification that it should be referred to as a rebellion and not a riot. But we need an official document. We need an official decision. We need to officially exercise self-determination. Just like we determined we would no longer be called Negroes, we would be called African Americans. Groups decided that and put that out. And then that's how, now you read all the news, everybody says it, right? Nobody gives credit where it's due, but everybody says it. But um, I make that and I ask, I call upon the City of Council of Newark to declare that monument, rebellion monument, and to declare that park, to officially name that park, Rebellion Park, here in Newark. Rebellion Park. So I want y'all to go to the city, y'all that live in Newark, go to the city council meetings, because they'll listen to you as a resident of this city. Your voice carries a lot of weight. So when people make that request, let's get that little plot of land named Rebellion Park. Let's get that monument officially named Rebellion Monument. And let's let them make it nice, put a fence around it and everything, you know, and make it nice, make it historical, you know. That's, that's how a historic site. This city was the hub of black power in the United States. People don't know that. This was the hub of black power. After the Black and, pa black and Puerto Rican Convention of 1970, there were other black political conventions. I was elected a delegate to the National Black Political Convention in Gary, Indiana in 1972. I was elected to that position at West Kenny Junior High School at the Essex County Black Political Convention. And then I was elected from there to the state black political convention that was held in New Brunswick. And then I went to Gary, Indiana, as the youngest delegate to the National Black Political Convention in 1972 with Amiri Baraka. And that was my transfiguring experience. It was after being at Gary that I, I had never seen. I came off of Ridgewood Avenue. That's like two blocks away. I lived at Ridgewood and Avon. I lived there when we had a cold water flat. There was no running hot water. I had never seen black people come together in unity like I saw it in Gary. I had never seen black people act like a government. They were like a government. They was 50 delegations, each identified, passing resolutions, make, making a national black political agenda. I was, I was only 18 in 1972. I just turned 18 in 1972. I'd never seen such a thing. So after that, I asked Amiri Baraka, to give me an African name, and he gave me the name of Demu Chunga, and I carry that name today, and we must never forget the great revolutionary contribution of Amiri Baraka to this city and to the Black Power Movement. We're going to have one more speaker here, and then we're going to have the rest of the speakers back at, re at where? What's, what's it called? Rebellion Park. What's the name? Rebellion Park. There's a sister and brother here. They came all the way from Philadelphia. I know this sister is no stranger to you. If you ever want to meet a real revolution, a real American revolutionary in the 21st century, this is her. Sister Pam Africa is here. Where's hey, Sister Pam? Tell her to come on up here. Oh. <laughs> come on. Sister Pam Africa. Right, 
like I don't want to take a lot of time. I just want to say that we're here in solidarity. We're here because we must be here. And uh, we want to see Rebellion Park. We want to see the name there. We want to be a part of that. We understand what's going on here. Everything I heard there today, I saw pictures. It looked like May 13th when they dropped the bomb, killing 11 men, women, and children of our family. The same things that the police did here. I'm saying, you know, everything they do is nothing new. And uh, But what we got to do is stay consistent. POP is one of the top organizations to be a part of and also that you can fight against this government. They teach, they educate, they march, they wherever you got to be in order to make change. That's why we're here. We stand with POP, we stand with the families here. I stand with the brothers and sisters that lost family members there, um, you know, at the rebellion. So, you know, let's stay together and, uh, and you know, media... We don't look for media anymore. Our media is here. We tell people, pull them cameras up. And uh, you know, and if you don't know what's going on, Google. Google. Go to YouTube. You'll find everything that went on here today. So let's pass it on. Continue to build, build, build. Because these people, these monsters, they're not people. They are building. Look at their children. They are teaching them how to do everything to kill us. And then when we do what it is that they're doing, teaching their children, they want to make us criminals. But we got to do it anyway because we're criminals from the womb on out. And also I'm saying we got to build and uh, we got to educate. And most of all, we got to defend ourselves by any means necessary. Teach the children the truth. Don't give them no lies. And that's what we heard here today. The sister that, you know, brought the paperwork here and uh, that investigated, investigated for her mother. That's what we do to teach people what it is that they don't know. People have hope in this government. There is no hope. There is no compromising. We must continue to dig and teach and educate. I want to, in Philadelphia, get hold of Michael Cord to do a uh, segment of radio shows called Rebellions. And we want to start off with the Newark Rebellion. All right, on the move. We're going to work that. On the move. 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 Is Brother Munir still here? I saw Munir. I saw Sheila, but I think. Oh, they're back. They're back at the park. All right, we're going to get back on the move back to Rebellion Park, but let me just make one more official request. Right. I need, I want to make official and a, an official public request that the deaths of the 26 people during the Newark Rebellion, that each one of those cases be reopened, and that we demand justice, that we demand that all 26 cases be reopened. I don't care how many years, 50, it took them 40 years to convict, that, that's right, it took them 40 years to convict the murderer of Medgavis, so there's no statute of limitation. We want, this sister didn't read, when she was reading those names, she don't know what an effect that had on me. And I was trying to hold in my mind that thought till I got here to make a public demand, not a request, a demand that those 26 people, you pick up Ron Parambo's book, No Cause for Indictment, they know Troopers and police, state troopers and guardsmen shot those people. Nobody was ever indicted. Not even indicted, much less brought to trial. So as chairman of the People's Organization for Progress, on behalf of every member of my organization, we demand that the 26 cases of the 26 people killed in 1967 be reopened by the state attorney general of New Jersey and by the U.S. attorney for New Jersey. No justice. No justice. No justice. No justice. If there ain't gonna be no justice. 
All right, let's walk. Let's march. Let, let them pull into the front. Let the hit banner come back out. Come on up. We 
gotta take stock as who's doing the murdering now. Because wrong is wrong and murder is murder and we've got to get to the point where we control our community by any means necessary. If other people won't protect us, we know how to protect ourselves. I got one thing to say in closing. As a person who was 26 years in the military, top secret clearance, I know that we know who bring guns in this community. I know who brings the drugs in this community. And I know that somebody could stop the drugs and the guns if they wanted to. But when you look at the destruction that's taking place today, it's black on black. But the, the, the facilitation, I don't know anywhere in this city where they manufacture guns. I don't know anywhere in this city where they manufacture drugs. But I know somebody knows where they are being imported into this city, and it's not just Newark. It's Jersey City, Patterson, Camden, Pleasantville, New Brunswick. All you have to do is follow the pattern. We can't, uh, we, we got to deal with that. But as we remember these folks, let us never, ever forget the call. It wasn't just one incident. It led from the time we got here to the present day. We have one thing that we need to do, not just today, but we need to make sure that our children are taught their history and their journey. And that is the duty of not only the public schools, but it's the duty of those of us in the community who know and understand. And I appeal to those folks who have the history, don't assume that our young people know that history. If we don't teach them, they won't know. Power to the people and we shall prevail. Give James Harris a big hand. Y'all know how, how long I've known him? 50 years. I met him in the summer of 1967. He was my first track coach. <laughs> um, right now, I want to ask my friend Richard Camareri to come and say a few words. Give him a hand, Richard Camareri. He is a member of the People's Organization for Progress. <laughs> And was here in 1967. Thank you, Larry. First, I want to thank Larry for his indefatigable leadership in ensuring the existence of POP and its sustainability and the annual occurrence of these commemorations. Um, you know, uh, El Haj Malik El Shabazz once said, History is a subject best suited to reward our studies. History, not math, not English, not engineering, but history. He said that, not that we become wallowed in history, but that we stand upon history to learn from it and to move forward. Yeah. I was here, I was born and raised in Newark, and I lived as a 15-year-old in 1967, about a half a mile away, over near a couple blocks from City Hospital. And the neighborhood I was in was working class. A lot of people worked for the Board of Education um, um, and other places, the city, housing authority. It was mainly a black neighborhood, um, and it was a time of great ferment, obviously the 60s. Now I was 15 years old. Amen. And um, when it jumped off, and we saw the things around us that we saw, it kind of opened my eyes as a 15-year-old young man. And I was, a fortunate, I was a fortunate young white boy. I had lived around a lot of black people, people who were intelligent, who were strong, cared about their families, who cared about their neighborhoods, and some of that did tend to diffuse the natural racist inclinations of growing up white in the United States. Now I use the term white obviously knowing that race has nothing to do with science, but it has a fierce psychological hold on us. It is something that was created, as Larry alluded to earlier, as a means for people to divide working class people. If you wonder about that, then think about this quote from one of the guys the so-called robber barons of the 19th century. Jay Gould built the railroads, the person, you know, uh, uh, recipients of corporate welfare. He once said, I can hire half the working class to kill the other half. That's American history, ladies and gentlemen. 
What we saw in 1967 and what I saw was something that opened my eyes as a young person. It was not comfortable. It was awkward. Um, but it was something to me that said, I have to start paying attention to what's going on around me. I have to decide who I am and what I stand for and who I will stand with. I saw the frustration and the uh, anger in the eyes of neighbors, again, most of whom were black, and I didn't understand it because I didn't have that inflicted upon me. But I knew I couldn't ignore it. And so I was fortunate in that I had people around me who helped me understand that and move towards becoming a more conscious human being. And there were people along the way in Newark who I would not have survived without as a person. Um, I can think of Joyce and Cliff Carter. I can think of Bob Curvin and Pat Curvin. My neighbors, Cordelia and Werner Henry. The Perrys who live next door to me. And if you're old enough, you might remember the fish store on the corner of Warren Street and North Fork Street. It had a big painting of a blue fish on the side of the wall that said the fish you eat here today last night slept in Chesapeake Bay. And those are some of the memories I have. But the key thing is that we come here today not to reminisce. We don't come here today just to commemorate. We don't come here today just to talk about, oh, what happened then. We come here today because people and organizations like POP understand that there's a relationship between what was, what is, and what should be. What should be is the hard part. That's the hard part that requires action, but not ignorant action, not unstudied action, not unstrategic action, but we need to study and analyze and strategize about what we need to do to make this the place it should be, to make North a place worthy of its residents. That's why I do what I do. That's why we all do what we do. That's why I've learned from all of my neighbors, the people around me. I stand on some very strong, tall shoulders, and I always recognize that. And for that, I'm thankful for having been through what I've been through. And again, I'm thankful for POP for doing this consistently in sustainability. And yeah, Larry, I remember 1984, meeting in our offices at North Coalition for Neighborhoods, debating about Jesse Jackson and Aluta Continua. Continua, Continua. Where's Ryan Haygood? I saw him. I hope he didn't leave yet. Where's Ryan Haygood? Ryan T. Haygood. Esquire. Give him a big hand. The Executive Director, New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Give him a big hand. All right, all right. Good afternoon. I'm going to ask my colleague, Andrea McChristian, to, to join me. I just want to say very, very briefly uh, that this is not news to you all, but this really is a moment that has been 50 years in the making. Uh, that is to say that people here assembled today, standing in the gap on behalf of our mighty residents, have been calling for this moment for at least 50 years going back to the Newark Rebellion. And we should be clear as we are that this was a rebellion. It was not a riot. It was an organized protest to resist the conditions under which we were living, which were deplorable for 50 years. Residents of this mighty city have been advocating for a transform police departments and a way to address the underlying systemic issues that have plagued our communities. And right now, 50 years later, the city of Newark is under a consent decree to transform its policing practices, not to make changes around the margins, but to fundamentally reimagine what policing should look like in this city. And so the Institute for Social Justice, the organization I lead, Andrew McChristian, my colleague, and I, we are leading this work for the Institute on behalf of the federal monitoring team. But this work, this transformation, it cannot happen without your voices. We need you desperately to be a part of the process that is to transform policing in this city in the way that residents have been calling for for 50 years. And so I want to ask my colleague, Andrea, to talk about how you can plug in and also something that she's leading on Friday, a conversation around the Newark Rebellion and its legacy, an intergenerational 
roundtable conversation with elders and with millennials to talk about, yes, the history of the Newark Rebellion, but what does it mean for us now and how does it guide and inspire us going forward? My colleague, Andrea McChristian. Good evening, everyone. First, I'd like to talk about, as Ryan said, our role in the monitoring team. We're really committed to community engagement. Now, we hear there have been a lot of promises made. We know that there have been reforms in the past. Reforms have come and gone. But this time, we're committing ourselves at the Institute to making sure that the community voice is in every part of the reform. It's in community policing. It's in stop searches and arrests. It's in use of force. But that's why we need you. We need you to make this process legitimate. And so when we have community meetings to discuss the policies, when we have community meetings to give feedback to the monitor, when we have community meetings to hear from the monitor about what's coming on, what's going on, we hope that you all will join us. So if you're not on our mailing list already, please see Ryan or I, and we'll make sure that you're notified about all the reforms that are going on. But something that also strikes me about this gathering is the intergenerational nature here. We have people who have been through the struggle, who have been through the strife, who are here for the rebellion. We have younger people whose family members were impacted. We have school children. We have people coming in from other cities to come here and make Newark their home who are impacted by this. I'm a newer, I'm a newer Newark resident, and I'm struck by the sense of community and love that people have for Newark. I moved from Harlem, and Harlem's great, but I've never seen the love, and I've never seen the sense of community that I see here in Brick City. And so this Friday at 6.30 at the New Jersey Historical Society, we're hosting an intergenerational conversation where we're having our Newark elders, we're having our millennials, and we're coming together to talk about what happened then, what happened now, and how we can have interconnectedness. So I hope you'll all come join us 6.30 this Friday at the New Jersey Historical Society, but I'm glad to be here at the Institute. We're committed to making sure the community voice is in every part of this reform. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say briefly, uh, Brother Larry Hamm is one of the speakers in the roundtable discussion. I just want to leave you with something. We at the Institute have created two commemorative posters to help folks remember this day, 50 years in the making, that is the Newark Rebellion. One of the posters features Bob Kervin. Bob Kervin helped to found the Institute for Social Justice, and the poster says that during the Newark Rebellion and throughout his life, Dr. Kervin fought for social and racial justice, and the organization that he helped to found uh, established, he helped to establish, continues that fight 50 years later. That's one poster. The second poster is of uh, the historic photo of the young man with his hands raised. And the top it says, the struggle for racial and social justice continues. On the bottom is a photo of kids at Avon Avenue School. It says, because their lives matter. So we want to leave these with you. We have them in the back. Take as many as you like. Share them with your friends, families. Frame them. But let's display these prominently to remember this moment and the work to be done. Thank you so much. Give him a big hand, Ryan Haygood. I'll be at the library. What? No, it's the Historical Society, right? Historical Society. Uh, where did Akinyele go? I saw Akinyele. A minute, Bashir Akinyele. Um, I he always lets me talk. There he is. Your brother, North Anti-Violence Coalition, Bashir Akinyele. Give him a big hand. The mighty, mighty North Anti-Violence Coalition. All right, all right. We're going to fire it up how we, how we normally do in the North Anti-Violence Coalition. We put our fists up in the air. We say, stop the violence. Stop the violence. Stop the violence. Stop the shooting. Stop the shooting. Stop the shooting. Stop the shooting. Stop the killing. Stop the killing. Stop the killing. Stop the killing. Black power. Black power. I know some of us are afraid to say that in 2017, Brother D. Muchanga, Larry Ham, but we say it anyway. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. All power to the people. All power to the people. All power to the people. Hotep. 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 Peace in the streets. Peace. In the streets. Peace. In the streets. And for my new millennium activists, I love y'all, man. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter.
Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. That's what's up, brothers and sisters. Let's give Brother Larry Hammond, the People's Organization for Progress, a strong round of applause. Man, where would, where would we be without our Brother Larry, man? When I was growing up in Newark, guess what? A lot of this stuff they never taught us in history. They never taught us about the real reasons behind the Newark rebellion. They said a bunch of Negroes took, burned the city down. That's what they said. They didn't talk about how racism was at the core of it, how classism was at the core of it, how oppression was at the core of it, and black people stood up and rebelled against, against oppressive forces in the city of Newark, brothers and sisters. They never taught me that. They never taught me about Malcolm X. They didn't talk me about the original Black Panther Party. Never taught me about the real history of the, some of the greatest civilizations in ancient Africa, brothers and sisters, all right? That's the reasons why I became a history teacher, huh? At Weekway High School. Big shout out to Weekway High School, IP every day. So hard to be an Indian. So hard to be an Indian. For real, man, I got my one of my, 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 my sisters, my mentor, Miss Ingrid Hill. Let's get... Sister Ingrid Hill, Vice Chair of the People's Organization for Progress, been a mentor of mine when I was a student of hers at Seton Hall University, brothers and sisters. You know, I'm a school teacher, and I'm going to leave this. I'm not going to make a strong, a long speech, just a strong one, and that's it. I'm out. Um, for all my new millennium brothers and sisters, you know, we, all, we were talking about Jay-Z's 444 album, yo. Cop that album. If you haven't done it so, please cop that album album the brothers talking about black power right now jay-z is talking about black power right now oh yeah that's what he's talking about on the album and he got all the young cats some of y'all who like some of y'all who say man i don't dig that rap music i don't like that rap music i don't like hip-hop but guess what for young people that's that's our cnn man that's how we figure out what's what the hell is going on in the world right now through hip-hop and rap music brothers and sisters so cop that album brothers and sisters but i'm gonna i'm gonna leave with this Please study the current, current commission. I know some of you original, you OGs already did that already. But for some of us who are coming up, we don't know the reasons behind the North Rebellion. But if you read the current commission, it, go, it gives us analysis of what created a uh, civil unrest here in Newark and all around the country. Again, racism, oppression, the lack of opportunities, the lack of poverty, brothers and sisters, all right? That's what, that's what did it. So with that being said, Brother Larry, I want to thank you for giving me the mic a little bit. Oh, real quick, July 19th, Wednesday, July 19th, we fired up in the streets for, uh, against the violence that's plaguing our city, the shootings and the killings. Yes, our brother Raz is doing a great job, but he can't do it by himself. He needs assistance. So we asking all of y'all, please come on out, text it out, Facebook it out. Twitter it out, gram it out, that's Instagram, gram it out, let everybody know that on Wednesday, July 19th, Wednesday, July 19th, 6 p.m., we're going to be in the middle of Border Market Street, we're shutting it down, we are shutting it down, we are speaking against all forms of violence, domestic violence, because our sisters are being killed, right, in, the, in their homes, not just in the streets, but in, in their homes, so we're going to speak against domestic violence, we're going to speak against community violence or black on black violence and we definitely going to speak against police violence brothers and sisters again my name is brother Bashir Muhammad Akinyele I'm a member of the Newark Anti-Violence Coalition Stop the Violence Black Power All Power to the People Hotel Peace in the Streets All Black Black Lives Matter y'all Hotel Peace I slam all that until long Akinyele Bashir I want to uh, call and I'm, I'm going to ask the speakers to try to make it tight from here on out because there's a whole lot of people that want to speak, and I'm going to let them all speak. I don't care if I'm the only one here left to listen to them. <laughs> but as a good brother that's doing good work with our poets, our spoken word artists, Brother Justice. And Brother Justice uh, is a good advocate for our brothers and sisters behind the wall on the other side of the wall, because we all behind the wall, really. And Malcolm X said, you in America, you born in jail. <laughs> Where's Brother Justice? Come on, brother. Give him a big hand, Brother Justice. Right by your side. Right by your side. Power to the people. No, power to the people. I'm honored to be here today to speak and share uh, some of my experience with the with, with us, the Norkas, thank Larry Ham, 
uh, the entire People's Organization for Progress, the North Anti-Violence Coalition, and all the other organizers. We have people here. I have family that was here during the time of the North Rebellion, and I study at the feet of the masters. It's important that we understand that it's the social conditions, the disenfranchisement that led to the North Rebellion, the dissatisfaction of the people. Dissatisfaction is always going to bring about change. That's the direct science right there. So when we talk about people being displaced, people not having opportunities, me, myself, I'm a North resident, born and raised. I served 23 years in this criminal legal system. I don't say the criminal justice system. It's the criminal legal system. Let's get that correct. And during that time, I transformed my life. But it's important to understand what led me into the criminal legal system. The lack of opportunity, like Brother Bashir was just talking about, they don't teach us about ourselves. I had to go to prison to educate myself, follow a similar path that Brother El Haj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X had to follow. This is where we get reborn at. This is where, and this is what, what they do is they manufacture knuckleheads. So not only do they disenfranchise us in society, they lead us, they destroy us in more than one way. They put us behind the wall. And our sisters are being attacked as we speak. The fastest growing pr prison population in America is the, is the women. So we need to get the youth involved, brothers like Amari Baraka, who still lives through us today, is somebody who inspired me, what I do, is I gather the, the spoken word and the poetry because there's so much positive energy flowing through these streets. So many young people have so much talent. And let us remember that at one time, as Larry Ham uh, 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 spoke about, is that Newark was the focus of the arts community. And we didn't do art for the sake of doing art. We did art to speak about our social ills. This was our voice. This was our platform. Wherever we make it at, we create platforms. So I'm not here to self-promote myself, but I am here to help, to, 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 to ask that we get the youth involved in, 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 in expressing themselves and support that. There should be youth here. We should be grabbing them up. Right? So I host an open mic spoken word event at the only black-owned bookstore in Newark, which is a pillar and a foundation of our community which is 867 Broad Street, the source of knowledge bookstore. This is where we have the free expressionless channel, all of this collective, creative energy into some positive change. Thank you for your time. I'm not going to take up too much time. Love you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. All right. But before we adjourn tonight, you know, uh, Brother James, John Smith's brother is a musician, and he said that he's going to play for us. So we're going to close out with his contribution. We're going to hear a couple of more people before I bring him up. Next person, I want to bring Barbara King and Max Herman up. But Sister Barbara King, Jenna was here in 1967. She was a part of the revolutionary movement in this city led by the Committee for a Unified Newark. That, that the leader of which was Amiri Baraka, then known as Imamu Baraka, and we affectionately call Sister Barbara King Jenna Misa. That's her African name. Give her a big hand, yeah. Barbara King. The body got it. I won't say it. The body got it. In Jame, a black power. Black power. Black power. Power to the people. First, I want to give. I want all of us to really, from our, the depth of our hearts, give a round of applause for the People's Organization in Progress, Brother Ardemu. Let him know we appreciate what he has done. Can we give him a round of applause? I'm going to uh, be very, very short. As he said, not only I was born and raised here in the city of North, but I lived on 17th Avenue where the rebellion started. And we saw all the things that was happening. I just graduated from high school. And who would ever think in North New Jersey, 1967, that you can come at your house in the
the daytime and see police riding up and down the streets with shotguns pointed at children, killing children. And when you talk about people being killed, when you actually see people every single day, I knew the Spellman family. I knew their mother. I knew their sisters and their brothers. We went to school with them. What the police did in this city, just shooting anywhere because they didn't look at us as human beings. They just look at us, as the brother said, Jay-Z said, and I won't use the word he said, but they really didn't look at us as people. That he said in his rap, and I agree with Brother Bashir, I'm too old to really be looking at, listening to certain raps. But I'll tell you, the things I heard him say, and he says in, in his uh, music, they're going to kill me. And when I listened, I said I could see why he says that. He said no matter what, if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're educated, he said you're still in the same situation. We all are in the same situation. People suffered and died in this city to make it a better city. And if it wasn't for Amiri and Amina Barak and the Committee for a Unified North, they helped change this city around so we can halfway live as human beings. But we still have a long way to go, as he would say in his poem. We come a long way, a long way to go. And all these organizations, we need to collaborate with each other. If you're not in an organization, I think the people's organization will be an excellent one to join. But we need to fight. We need to continue to fight so our children can live. If they can say to the president, Obama, when he spoke, that you're a liar, that means no matter what, as Jay-Z said, whether you're rich, poor, famous, or whatever, they still think of us less than the human beings. And I just want to go a little way out and say thank all the people with good hearts who want to make a better world. Let's help the mayor start with this city with this country, and let's change the world. Thank you. All right. All right. Amazing. Asante Sana. <laughs> you never guess who called me. You never guess who called me the other night. Never called me in my life. Maulana Karanga. <laughs> called me 11 o'clock at night. I didn't believe it was him. I thought somebody was playing a joke. Y'all know Maulana Karanga? The creative Kwanzaa? Call me up. I was like, what? I didn't believe it was him. Okay. Um, we're going to hear from uh, Walia, Max Herman, and Zaid Muhammad. And then we're going to close it out. Uh, and the vice chairman, I want y'all to give the other leaders of the People's Organization for Progress, Brother Larry Adams, Ingrid Hill, our vice chair people, give them a big hand. But, uh, Max, Max Herman, where you at? Max is a historian, has written a book on the North Rebellion. Give him a big hand. Thank you, Larry. Thank you for having me. This is my 16th consecutive year coming out here. Sometimes I think I don't have too much more to say after 16 years, but I do have a few things. I want to, I am a sociologist and historian, and I like facts, and I, there are a few facts that need to be corrected here. Um, one of those facts that needs to correct, be corrected is right on that stone that a young gentleman by the name of Albert Mercier, not Messier, uh, was killed by the Newark police while allegedly looting a vacuum cleaner. He was shot in the back of the head, and you see his picture in the governor's report lying face down in a pool of blood. His mother, Ann Penn, could not be here today. And she needs all of our help as well. She's had a very difficult life. She was recently evicted from her apartment in Tiffany Manor. She is staying with her, I believe, with her daughter right now, but she needs help finding a permanent place to live. Um, a gentleman by the name of Moise Abraham contacted me about two weeks ago, very upset. He was upset that a website I wrote um, way back, about 10 years ago, when I was working at Rutgers, had some misinformation about his mother. It claimed that his mother was brought by his father to Martland Hospital. It, she was brought to Martland Hospital, but she was not brought by his father. His father was estranged from the family, and 
Moise was very upset that the official report says he was brought by his father. Wow. He was brought by a neighbor. His, his mother was shot as she was looking for Moise. He went out to, he was a teenager, he went out to see what was going on and she was looking for him and as she came back into her house she was struck by a bullet. Another fact to correct, actually two facts in one. Uh, Detective Fred Toto and Captain Michael Moran were not killed by snipers. I have done research on this for quite some time and there is no shred of evidence that either of these two gentlemen were killed by snipers. Unfortunately, their children have suffered as well. The two daughters of, of Fred Toto uh, were orphaned when their mother killed herself a year later and they, they basically raised each other so they suffered too but there is a misconception that their father was killed by snipers when he was not in fact the the evidence suggests that he was killed in the crossfire between the state police and the national guard units whose radios did not communicate with each other and who were firing at each other not knowing what they were firing at so there's still inf new information that arises and there are still facts that need to be corrected here and it's very very important that we stick accurately to the historical record so that we can honor the people whose lives were sacrificed to help this city move forward and the last thing I'll say and it's a little self-serving is that I was misquoted this morning in USA Today um, and it's not the first time I've been misquoted, but I'm particularly upset about it because they implied that I felt that the black politicians who took over in the wake of the rebellion were as corrupt as the white politicians who preceded them. They quoted me as saying that. I just wanted to go on the record that I did not say that. Um, and the historical record that is presented in the media, unfortunately, often distorts the, the record as well. So. I guess my general point is don't trust everything you read in the paper. Don't trust everything you read in the official, quote, riot commission reports because those are full of inaccuracies as well. Trust the people that you hear from that have lived through these experiences, people like the Spellman family, the Penn family, Larry, and everybody else that's here today who lived through it. I did not live through it. I was born in 68, but I've spent a lot of time gathering information and I'm always willing to correct the record when it needs to be corrected. So, again, thank you for having me today to Larry and, and Pop and Power to the People. Power to the People. To the people. Is Munir still here? I saw Munir. Munir, he left. Oh, man. I should have called him to speak. Um, Sister Walia Brooks from Impedum. Give them a big hand. Uhuru! 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 That means freedom. <laughs> Uhuru, comrades. Yes, Uhuru means freedom. My name is Walia Brooks. I'm representing the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement. I just want to say that um, I'm glad to be here in solidarity with POP to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the North Rebellion. Um, I wasn't born at that time, but I learned about the rebellion from my aunt. She told me how it started with the cab driver being brutalized, and she taught me about all the looting and that the Asians would put on their store soul brother, so the, the the black people wouldn't go into their stores. But I think things like this is important because we need to know our history. And um, I see something on the internet saying we are not our ancestors, as if to say that our ancestors were not rebellious and didn't fight back and I found that to be very disrespectful and I think everything that's happening this week to commemorate the rebellion and this right here and naming this rebellion part just showed that our ancestors did fight back we did resist oppression we did resist police brutality and we must keep this going for the generations to come who do not know the history Aurora. Aurora. I, um, I, the uh, International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement believes that we all must be organized to overturn the, col the colonial capitalist state that we live in. We believe that 
revolution is the only solution and that we need to be organized whether you're with pop or you're doing something out in the streets we can't just stay on social media and expect change so once again thank you for letting us join you out here today thank you for keeping the history thank you for broadcasting this and and the week-long events for the generations that's out here right now to know what's going on in the city of Newark and to realize that Newark has always been a city of resistance and a city of rebellion, and we're going to keep it going. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Give a big hand. So glad Impedum is here, represented by the chairman, Omalia Shatella. That's my man. You know what's funny? Somebody sent me a picture. In fact, it was Keith. Keith sent me a picture today with me, Amiri Baraka, Charles Barron, Omali Yeshitella, and Amina Baraka in the same picture. I got you. You got that, right? You said that to me today. Um, I can't help but think, you know, it didn't rain. It was supposed to rain, right? It didn't rain. I can't help to think, you know, I'm not, I try not, I struggle against metaphysics. I struggle not to give into metaphysics, but I, I can't, I can't help but to feel that this meeting was supposed to happen today. I mean, the fact that John Smith's brother was here, we've been doing this for 33 years. I didn't even know John Smith had died. He died in 2002, but his brother is here. I mean, I, and, and then... West, Councilman Westbrook shows up. I mean, it just, for me, it's a magical moment. I mean, it's a sad moment. I don't want to take away from the gravity of the moment because we're here to commemorate those who were lost. But there's a certain magic when the old comrades come together. Dr. Garrett was here. Dr. Garrett was on the Board of Education in 1967. He was a board member. And he did what? He delivered Asada's baby. He delivered my baby. He delivered my oldest daughter, Laini, at Presbyterian Hospital. It's closed now, but it was open in 74, in 70, January 75, when Laini was born. And he was fighting for black students to Right. He was fighting to get that medical school to admit black students. And Councilman Westbrooks was here. And it's just a magical moment but anyway enough rumination brother james don't leave we want you to play don't leave just just give me two more speakers um vice chairman adams i'm gonna let zaid be the light close it out vice chairman adams give him a big hand larry adams power to the people power to the people power to the people sisters and brothers we stand on the shoulders of giants, not just these 26 martyrs, but the masses of people who in all their might rose up against what was a system of oppression and exploitation, who demonstrated the law of social development, that oppression breeds resistance. And out of that resistance comes the intensity of struggle. And Chairman Ham alluded on many occasions today to two weeks after the rebellion simmered was the Black Power Conference and then the Black and Puerto Rican Conference. That is the tradition of a liberation struggle. It's the tradition of the Black liberation struggle. That there be a coming together of forces to formulate plans and strategies and organize troops to go back into battle. The intensification of state terror across the country has led us the resurgence of our movement, the struggle for freedom and against oppression. That in Ferguson, in Baltimore, across the country, there are battlefronts for freedom. POP participates in the Black Liberation Unity Committee. And in recognition of the resurgence of the Black Liberation Movement, we unite with other forces around the country on different battlefronts, some in the fight against police terror, 
some in the struggle against gentrification and ethnic cleansing of our communities in the housing struggle, some in the fight for, le for legitimate and productive education, but recognizing necessity to pull together the forces, to unite the battlefront, to develop a common strategies and slogans and programs and direction. Again, moving forward with the conference movement from W.B. Du Bois in the beginning of the 19th century all the way up through the Black Power Conference and the Black and Puerto Rican conferences here in North. And that we call for a national assembly for black liberation. We call for a national assembly as necessary to elevate the level of struggle and its intensity. If you want to be part of that process, you support that process sign on to this endorsement. And it's also, this endorsement, it says we the undersigned hereby state our support for organizing a National Assembly for Black Liberation to take place in the fall of 1917, uh, 1971, about uh, 2017. This is not something that started yesterday. It's a work in progress. It's been going on for several years now. We ask for your name and an email address and we will send you weekly bulletins on how the process is going. We will send you weekly bulletins that contain nuggets of the history of struggle, of the black freedom struggle, and the struggles of other oppressed people, and the unity of them. And that the common enemy of imperialism, led by U.S. imperialism, that is at the root of all of our oppression. Pick up a copy of the Freedom Manifesto, a draft document for that assembly to be debated and discussed and added to and torn apart, but to formulate for us a program of struggle, a platform to move forward. Pick up a Freedom Manifesto. If you support the idea of a National Assembly for Black Liberation, give me your name and social, and uh, I don't want your social, <laughs> your name and your email address. Forward ever, backward never. Power to the people. Give our vice chairman a big hand. Give him a big hand. You know he's a former union leader. He was the president of the New York Postal Workers for 15 years. And he gave concrete aid to the People's Organization for Progress during those years that he was head of the Postal Workers Union. See, you just look at people. You see us all with yellow shirts on. You don't know the story. <laughs> Each shirt got its own story. Like, this brother just gave me a paper that I wrote in school. I don't know. How, he told me how he got it. I don't know how the person got it. This paper is 30, year, 30 years old. A paper I wrote on Fidel Castro at, at Princeton University. I'm not going to read what the professor said. A plus. The, title, a plus. the title of the paper was Fidel Castro charismatic or revolutionary leader and the paper is 30 pages long I wrote this 30 years ago now there's some comrades here from India who are also celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Naxalbari movement did I say it right give them a big hand did you you want to say something real quick give them a big hand all right, okay. we'll, we'll go forward. Okay. All right, Brother Zaid Muhammad, come on and give us a strong conclusion in your inimitable way. <laughs> I can't even spell it. <laughs> All power to the people. 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 To the, to the Spellman family, all the families represented here. Uh, all the veteran and elders uh, who have been out here, those who have been out here longer than me, I've been, I've been out here for 40 years, right? Uh, to all the young people soaking it up, trying to take it in and, and trying to prepare yourselves to take it to the next stage, we need you. Uh, I was just trying to keep really, you know, with so much has been said today, I was really trying to figure out what the hell to say to kind of try and bring this together. Uh, I was, uh, just I'll start with my own place on during those days I was actually I'm originally from Plainfield and I'll come back to Plainfield in a minute I'm originally from Plainfield but I was in East Orange on Central Avenue and South Clinton Street 
There's a Boston market there now. It was the Geno's back then, right? Uh-oh, I hear some folks talking about what all I'm talking about, right? Instead of getting my Geno's giant, I'm watching these tanks roll down and live and live in color down my street on into North that my, I couldn't get into because my family wouldn't let my family go in because it was so dangerous. And when I went back home and told about the tanks I saw, I got my behind whoop for standing out there watching them tanks instead of running and getting out of the way because who knows what could have happened. One of the reasons why this is important because we have changed the narrative and changed the dialogue by holding true to this honor. What do I mean? When this thing jumped off, the dialogue was that Negroes were rioting, they were ruling, and they needed to be put in place at whatever cost. That was the narrative. Now, I had a poster that showed you a picture of a Mary Baraka with a skull cracked, handcuffed to a radiator uh, when they locked him up, but his friend, Jean-Paul Sartier, heard about what happened to him. And for those of y'all too young to know who Jean-Paul Sartier was, he was the most famous writer in France at the time, and he was nobody's liberal. He was a serious radical, right? Sartier started calling folks up, and before you know it, that lie had been broken, and the world started coming to North to see what was really happening. Yes, there wasn't a, a, a riot, but the rioting was done by the police. The police were shooting up the black businesses. The police were shooting us up. You, you saw Ms. the story of uh, Ms. Ms. Spellman, right? The police were doing all that shooting. Police were shooting each other. Two of theirs went down, Max told you, from their own fire because they were so reckless and abandoned. There was no sniper fire. The, the, the dialogue was so terrible. There's a picture that was taken from an old story that was done on Harlem's Black Underground, and that was planted in the press to say that that's how black folks were rolling in windows shooting at North police. It did not happen. It did not happen. So in 50 years, we're still correcting the record. Still correcting the record. So I hope the press really gets that because the press was one of the main accomplices to the distortion of that record because the press was racist then and the press is racist now. And I'm saying that to you as your press officer responsible for getting all these cameras out here. We want you to get the story, but we don't want you to take it back with your prejudice up the hill in the suburbs. We want you to get the story right so we can truly change this game. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Get the story right. If you must tell a story, tell a story right. Now, appreciate this, the time that we're living in now, as a result of that rebellion, as a result of the revolutionary organizing that came out of that period, it forced this state to expand on its social uh, contract. It rights where they had to concede rights to us they didn't want to. They had to build and open up the, the so-called New Deal with more programs to try and keep us off of the streets and to keep these uprisings from happening. Where are we now? We're in a paradigm now where all of that is under attack. All of that is being evaporated, and if we're not careful, all of that is going away. This whole thing with Trump, just because he's a clown, that doesn't mean he's not a dangerous clown. He is. Just because the right wing in Congress is backwards, we can't dismiss them because they're backwards. They're dangerous with their backwardness. Just because they got a, a knucklehead that they put on the Supreme Court, we can't dismiss him because he's a knucklehead. He's a dangerous knucklehead because he's on the Supreme Court. So... Just as we needed revolutionary organizing then to expand the paradigm for social welfare and social change, we need to up the ante again on revolutionary organizing. And as we see all these problems in the street with our babies killing each other, Black Power Movement that was married to the Black Arts Movement. We need another cultural revolution to open our babies' minds up. And we have in our hands something that also came right out of the stream of struggle right here in this community. There's a bill. New Jersey is the only state that has it, but don't do a damn thing with it. It's called the Amistad Bill. Yes. Amistad Bill says you're supposed to, not just in black uh, uh, towns, not just in brown towns, it says that all schools, all public schools in the state of New Jersey are supposed to properly teach and incorporate black and brown history into, the, into their curriculums. The problem with that is that it ain't got no enforcement.
ultimate team. So it's just a resource for those teachers who want to get away from their lesson plans, and it's nothing more. We need to be the ones to make that something real, because that's one of the things that can tend to educate young people out of some of their racism and get our kids on course with who they really are and what they can really do. Y'all understand what I'm talking about? So this is not no empty celebration. We ain't just calling names and taking pictures and remembering the good old days. You see all these bodies going down, how good were they? No. This is about honor and struggle by updating and upgrading and taking struggle to the next stage. Y'all hear me? Say so, also all power to the people. All power to the people. All power to the people. Never forget. 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 All power to the people. Oh, I'm so old. No, no, no. I'm, I'm going to introduce James. James. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah. Gonna... All right. We, the last formal presentation tonight, Brother James, the brother of John Smith, is going to play us a selection. He's a musician by vocation. So he's going to give us a selection before we leave tonight. He's going to do Round Midnight by Miles Davis. Yeah. By, oh, Thelonious Monk. I know the I know the Miles Davis version, but Thelonious originally wrote it. Yeah, but I give you a taste of Miles. All right, are you gonna give me a taste of Miles? All right. <laughs> I will hold the mic for you. You can play into the mic.
I think I first heard it maybe 1964, 1965. Would that be about right? Yes. My Aunt Joan gave me that album to listen to. Brothers and sisters, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight, for staying so long. We actually started almost on time, right? <laughs> Pretty close to 4.30, and it's 7.30 now, so we've been out here three hours. The ancestors smiled upon us and held back the rain that they predicted all day yesterday. All this morning, they said rain by 3 o'clock, and the rain was held back. We had a strong march. We really looked strong going up and down Urban Turner Boulevard. That's the way we got to do it all the time. And I'm so thankful that all of you came out and I want to express my utmost love for you. I love you. I love you so much. If you only knew. This has a little to do with politics. If it was about politics, I probably would have stopped doing this 15 years ago. But Che Guevara, it's funny that the, the teacher gave me a paper. I don't know how he came by a paper that I wrote to one of his students that I wrote at Princeton University. I wrote that paper 20, 29 years ago in March of 1978. But it reminds me of the words of uh, Che Guevara. At the risk of seeming ridiculous, I want to say that revolutionaries are motivated by true feelings of love. The People's Organization for Progress, we love our people, we love this city, we love our community, and we want to see Newark continue to rise from the ashes. And it has made some progress. I can remember when I finally was there. How many people remember where Good Deal was? Anybody remember where Good Deal was on Springfield Avenue? That's where I used to do the shopping. And when they finally let us come out to do food shopping, I went to Good Deal, and I can remember the air just smelled the burning buildings. You couldn't walk anywhere on the street without crunching glass. You see those gratings on that building right there? Those gratings didn't exist before 1967. After 67, all the stores started. First, they had these like chain link gratings that you could see through, but I guess they, that wasn't enough, so they went and got those solid gratings and people thought that Newark would fail but the people here were determined yes. and they have kept the city from failing and progress has been made there's been a dualism in Newark a simultaneous dynamism and decay both occurring at the same time in the business district we see dynamism we see a new Panasonic headquarters, a new legal and communications center, a new PSC and G building. We see the new shop right here. And that's good. What person would not want to have a new performing arts center and a new arena? Nobody's against that. We all are glad to have that. But when I go back to my neighborhood, where I lived for 23 years, 527 South 12th Street, it's in worse shape today than it was in 1967. And I am not exaggerating. And many of the conditions that produce the rebellion are still with us. And that's why we have to keep fighting. And I tell you this, that if they don't correct these conditions, there'll be more rebellions. That, I, you know, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but it'd be like me standing here and telling you, There'll be no more hurricanes. There'll be no more tornadoes. It's not because I want it to happen. It's that the conditions are there to make it happen. And these conditions are still here. That's why there was an uprising in Baltimore two, a, a year ago. And an uprising in Ferguson, Missouri two years ago. And there'll be more uprisings. There hasn't been a decade since 1967. Where there hasn't been major, look at Los Angeles in the aftermath of the beating of Rodney King. That was wor almost worse than the Watts Rebellion. And 66 people were killed during the Watts Rebellion. The Detroit Rebellion will be 50 years in two weeks in Detroit. And just think about Detroit. Now, in Newark, they had the police, the troopers, and the National Guard. 
in Detroit, they had the police, the troopers, the National Guard, and they had to bring in the 82nd Airborne. The same 82nd Airborne that was fighting in Vietnam, they had to bring them home to put down the rebellion in Detroit. And these rebellions will continue. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants destruction. Who wants to see people kill? Nobody wants to see people kill. Who wants to see people go to jail? Aren't there enough black people in jail? Nobody wants to see more people go to jail. But you have to understand, these things happen independently of our individual will. It, it has very little to do with morality. It has everything to do with the dynamics of power and how power operates. And the rebellion was an extension of a struggle that black people have been waging in this country, in the Western Hemisphere, for over 400 years, from the time of the first slaves that were brought to Santo Domingo, to Cuba, and other islands. And then in 1619, August 23rd, they bring the first African people to Jamestown, Virginia. And five years after that, they bring the first Africans to New Jersey because there was nobody to work the land. And they've been, they, for 250 years, this country took our free labor. But brothers and sisters, we have to continue to fight. I, I, I make a statement here. In the interest of full disclosure, I want everybody to know that I support Mayor Ross Barack and I support his re-election. So I don't want there to be any unclarity on any people's part. He's homegrown, yes. born in North. Yes. He wasn't. He didn't come from Burton County. He was born in North, born here, born in this city. Went to public schools in this city. Graduated. Went to Howard University. Graduated with honors from Howard University. And unlike a lot of college graduates, he didn't go halfway across the country. He came back home. Was a school teacher, a principal became a council person and is now the mayor. There couldn't be a better person for Newark at this time. There couldn't be a more authentic person for Newark at this time. Now you say, well, why are you telling us that? I'm telling you that because what I'm about to say. If angels ran the city of Newark, it wouldn't be enough. Because the problems that face the people in this city are beyond the scope of municipal government to solve. Controlling municipal government has severe legal limitations. First of all, from the beginning, cities are not entities of themselves. They are created and chartered by the state legislature. So a city can only go so far before the state government will pull in the reins. So there's only so much you can do as mayor. There's only so much you can do as a city council. This is why, brothers and sisters, Dr. King wrote in 1966, in his book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? He wrote it in 66. The book was published in 1967. Dr. Martin Luther King said, we must have a radical redistribution of power and wealth in America. These problems that urban areas face cannot be solved by state and local government. It requires, first of all, radical reforms. What's a radical reform? A radical reform is a reform that if you implement it, you will see some large-scale improvement in the qualities of people's life. What was a radical reform? You know the city subway? How many people rode the Newark light rail? The Newark city subway. You know what that was? That was a WPA project. Works Progress Administration. Created during the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Why was it created? because there was 25% unemployment in the United States of America
during the Great Depression. And Roosevelt created a set of agencies that implemented a set of policies that put three million people back to work in less than 36 months. That is a radical reform. And that is what we need immediately. We need a national jobs program to put people to work at jobs at a living wage, not at a minimum wage. You can't do nothing with a minimum wage except take your butt to work and come home. That's all you can do with a minimum wage. You can barely feed yourself with a $7.25 an hour. We need to increase the minimum wage at least to $15. But I'm going to tell you, $15 ain't a lot of money. $15 an hour? You know what a minimum wage would be in Essex County in 2017? A living wage would be $25 an hour. That's a living wage. That's a wage where people can pay rent, buy food, pay the bills, feed the children, etc. And that's what we need. We need a living wage in the United States of America. The second radical reform would be universal health care for all. Nobody, nobody should have to think twice about going to the doctor because they worried about whether or not they can pay for it. This country prides itself on being a capitalist country. But I tell you this, this is a retrograde capitalist country. This is a capitalist country that can't even keep up with the other capitalist countries. Canada has universal health care. Mexico has universal health care. England has universal health care. Germany has universal health care. France has you they capitalist countries. I didn't say Cuba because Cuba is socialist and you would expect a socialist country to do that. Other capitalist countries have universal health care. We're the only one that don't. And that's why in advanced capitalist America, we have infant mortality rates that are as high as those in many third world countries. So we need a national jobs program, jobs at a living wage. We need universal health care. You know what else would be a radical reform? The elimination of student debt. If you could bail out the banks, then bail out the millions of students. These kids are graduating from college with 30, 40, $50,000 in student loans. They won't pay those loans off in their lifetime. But we'll pay the banks. We took 12 trillion taxpayer dollars and bailed out Citibank, Chase Manhattan, J.P. Morgan. We gave them money so that they could continue to pay their executives multi-million dollar salaries. But we make students who ain't even got a job pay for college education. College education should be free in the United States of America. That would be a radical reform. You know what else would be a radical reform? A moratorium on all home foreclosures. Stop putting people out of their houses. A moratorium. That's what FDR did during the Great Depression. You know what FDR did? He closed the banks. He did. He closed them. He shut them down. And he said, we're going to have a moratorium on home foreclosures. Because there were so many people living in the streets they had what they call Hooverville because the depression had happened when Hoover was the president. People were living under bridges, large communities, living outside Hooverville, and that's where we are now. It's a disgrace that in this, the richest country in the world, people are on the streets begging for food. You can't go to McDonald's, to Wendy's, to Burger King, to Popeye's, to Checkers, Somebody stands by the food menu board to ask you for money or to ask you for food. That is a disgrace in this country. It is a disgrace in the United States of America that we have nearly 20 million people who could technically be classified.
identified as homeless. It's a disgrace in this country that half of half, 50 percent of the American population lives at the poverty level. That is a disgrace. And less than 0.001 percent of the people in this country control 90 percent of the wealth. So we need jobs that we need a living wage in the United States. We need a national jobs program. We need universal health care. We need the elimination of student debt. We need a moratorium on home foreclosures. That are, those are radical reforms. And if we could achieve those, it would be a major achievement. But I tell you this, that even if we did all of that, it wouldn't be enough. And I tell you this, and I tell you because I want you to be witnesses to this. Because I don't know how much longer I will be with you. But I tell you, we cannot get to the root of the problem until we have a revolution in the United States of America. We need a revolution. Now, it's my hope that such a revolution could be a peaceful revolution could be a political revolution. I would hope so. I hope that. But as Frederick Douglass said, it's going to be a struggle. Whether it's a struggle with words, or whether it's a struggle with blows, or whether it's a struggle with both, there must be a struggle. Black people are in this paradigm of white supremacy, of white superordination, and black subordination because of the capitalist system. Slavery and capitalism evolved at the same time. They are twins attached at the hip. In fact, one could say that the slave trade laid the basis for capitalist development in the United States of America. That it was the slave trade that enabled the accumulation of wealth through the cotton industry through the tobacco industry and other industries that utilize sweat slave labor that laid the basis for industrialization, that gave the capitalists the money that they needed for mechanization. We are not going to be able to change this fundamental paradigm unless we make a revolutionary transformation. Many people like to quote Dr. King and say we need a revolution of value. I agree with that, but I go further. I go all the way with Dr. King. Read his book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? Read chapter nine, called The World House. In chapter nine, Dr. King says, quote, we need a radical transformation of our socioeconomic system. And this is why they killed him. It wasn't just because of the Vietnam War. They killed him because they knew he wanted to make a revolutionary transformation. And they killed him because they knew that he was a leader that could in fact reach over the walls of race and ethnicity and build a multiracial movement. I am a child of the black power movement. I stand here today because of the black struggle and the black movement. I believe in self-determination for black people. And I believe, as with any oppressed group, black people must unite to correct their situation. But I tell you this, that by ourselves, we cannot correct this situation. Because the correction requires the radical transformation of our political system and our economic system. And the only way that we can build a critical mass of people large enough to do that is if we have in that movement people of all races and tendencies who are ready to make revolutionary transformation. When we stand on the corner of Broad Market every Saturday and we recruit for the People's Organization for Progress, we say this. The People's Organization for Progress only has one requirement to join our organization. We don't care what your religion is. We don't care who you sleep with. We don't care what political party you belong to. We're not concerned about your gender or your sex. We don't care about whether you go to the mosque or go to the church. We have one requirement and one requirement.
requirement only. Do you want justice? If you want justice, then come and join with us. Our organization, our arms are open to everybody who is ready to struggle. And if you're not quite ready to struggle for revolution, that's okay too. None of us started out that way. We all started out as reformers, and we're still reformers. We still support reform. We demand reparations for the descendants of Africans enslaved in this country. We demand that. We support reform, but we understand that reform by itself is not going to be enough. We need a new movement. And as we leave here today, brothers and sisters, we got to grow this movement. We cannot change the world with a handful of people. That's right. Can't do it. We got to have masses. Now, we don't have to have everybody. But you got to have enough people to make a fight. Amen. If they got 100 people, you can't come with 10. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you got to come with 100 or come with more. So I challenge you who are here today. I challenge you and I invite you to join the People's Organization for Progress. We are a grassroots organization. We work for racial, social, economic justice and peace. All we have is a little bitty membership form. It only takes a few minutes to fill it out. We meet every Thursday at 6.30 at the Abyssinian Baptist Church, 224 West Kenny Street in Newark, and we protest every Monday. That's right. Every Monday we protest in front of the federal building in Newark demanding justice for Jerome Reed, killed by Bridgeton police, justice for Abdul Kamal, killed by Irvington police, justice for Kashad Ashford, killed by Lynnhurst police, justice for Redaz Hearns, yes. killed by Trenton police, justice for Elvin Jesus Diaz, killed by Hackensack police. We demand justice for all victims of police brutality. So come and join us. Come to the meetings. You don't have to join. Just come to the meeting. Check it out. If you like it, fine. If you don't like it, then at least join another organization. But we are in front of the federal building every Monday, 4.30 to 6 o'clock, every Thursday at Abyssinian Baptist Church. Are there, are there any announcements people want to make? Good. Zaid says no. We don't need you. Yes, no. Oh, you got one. You was doing like this, so I thought you meant go ahead. <laughs> Sunday, July 16th, I pass it out to most of you. It's the 70th birthday of Asada Shakur, right? The only reason why she is alive is because we had a revolutionary underground that liberated her and got her to Cuba, right? So join us 4.30 uh, Sunday for Asada's 70th birthday. Next Wednesday, I'm sorry, at the Refile Center, thank you, 271 South 9th Street. July 19th, the Mighty Mighty North Anti-Violence Coalition shuts down broader market to condemn the recent spate of violence that's going on in our community. That'll take place at 6 o'clock. The Mighty Mighty North Anti-Violence Coalition shuts down Broad and Market July 19th, Wednesday, 6 o'clock. We'll see you in the world. All right. Brothers and sisters, thank you very much. Everybody register and vote. Don't forget, we got an election coming up in November, and Trump must go. Power to the people. Power to the people, brother. Thank you, brother. Everybody signed the attendance sheet. Everybody signed what, a, what a miracle.